always love when there's no reason for you to receive it, except him. He was, uh, Richard Wormann once told me, he was in prison, and an older man, an older saint among them, an older pastor, he said to them, he said, do you want to tell me your, he said to Richard Wormann, you want to tell me your sins? You, you have to get this off your shoulder. You want to just, uh, and so he started confessing. He, he actually, Richard Wormbrand said that to Gary Selman once. Gary Selman, he, he says, would you like to confess your sins to me? And not as a, he says, just, Gary said, no, 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 I don't, I don't want to, you know. Not that you're doing to a priest or anything, but, it's, it's, but actually it's biblical to, to one another. But the thing is that it said, he started saying, well, I, I have big, I've had big sins in my life. He, Richard Wormbrand said, I've had big sins. I've done this and I've fallen in different things. And, and he said to, the, the older man said to Richard Wormbrand, I said, you know, you're young now. I said, you've committed big sins and you will commit more sins before you're finished. But one sin you must never commit. And that is never commit the sin of thinking that your sin is greater than the love of God. And so to us, God wants you to love without reason except him, and he wants you to receive his love without reason. You don't need it. In fact, when you are feeling most unworthy, that's when you're really going to learn what grace is all about. That's when we're going to be transformed by the amazing grace. What does amazing mean? I don't understand it, but I still accept it anyway. I don't deserve it. I don't warrant it. I didn't earn it, but I accept it anyway. It's amazing. We don't just accept grace. We accept an amazing grace. The mystery of love. It also, that it never, he learned, it never needs a reason. It never needs a reason to keep persevering. You just keep persevering even when you don't know any other, any, there's no other reason but God and his love. That's it. You know? There was a time when he almost lost his faith in prison when they were brainwashing the, the prisoners. And they were telling them that Christianity, the faith is dead. Nobody outside believes anymore. It's dead. Your family abandoned you. Nobody believes anymore. And he finally believed it. And it was then he saw, he saw a picture of Mary Magdalene at the tomb. Was it reasonable for Mary Magdalene to go to the tomb and anoint the body when he's, or just to stay by the tomb? She stayed outside the tomb. Why? He's dead. That was not reasonable, but it was love. It was love because she would rather be with him dead in the tomb than anywhere else with, with someone who's alive said, even if it's all gone, I'm still going to stay with you. And so he said, when I saw that, it was the Lord ministering. He said, all right, even if nobody believes anymore, if it's all dead on the outside, I will wait by the tomb. I will wait until it rises again, as it will. That you need to hold fast to God's love even when there's nothing else, and especially when there's nothing else. You hold on no matter what. Even there are times you feel like giving up, and, and there are times you say, why, Lord? But yet still I'm going to hold on to you. Still I'm going to hold on. I'm going to hold on. You never, you know, you know turn, to, turn to Matthew 5. You, it never needs a reason to receive it. You never need a reason to persevere in it. And you never need a reason to give it away and give it to that person. Verse 43. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you in order that you might be children of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the just and the unjust, the evil and the good, and he sends his reign on the righteous and the unrighteous. His life and the life of many people who have suffered for their faith is a life of forgiving the worst people. The, their enemies, you know? And it's kind of like, you know, that in these other countries, you see these saints of God because you either have to get bitter or you have to become a saint. It's either one way or the other. You have to really, either, you know, when someone sins against you, you, you know, you, you think it's a bad thing. It's not. It's a choice to either become bitter or become a real saint, you know? It's, you can't, you know, want to become a real saint? Then thank God for their sins against you because it's, it's enabling you to become like the Lord. You know, his life was characterized by loving his enemies. You know, when, when, and not that he didn't, people, you know, everyone has faults, and, but the thing is, love characterized the life of God's saints. And the thing is that, uh, you know, during the time when the, when the, when the kind of Nazi uh, party was in control of Romania, uh, you know, he was in hiding, he hid Jews, other Jews, you know. When the communists took over and they were, they were hunting down Germans, he hid German soldiers, you know, as a Jew, you know. In Sofia, Bulgaria, 
And these are the kind of stories that God has blessed, you know, just, just in, strengthens our faith. You know, there was an imprisoned Christian who was put in a cell the size of a, a man, and, and there were nails inside this thing. And if they, they moved in the slightest way, if they started falling down, they would be pierced. And when the door was locked, his words were, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And the warden who was doing this, the communist warden, said, what do you mean? What do you mean? And he opened the door again. And so he found the, you know, and he started sharing the gospel with his, his torturer. And, and when they, they later came, others came back, communists came back to the scene, they found the warden on his knees praying to receive the Lord. And they, the warden told the communist ones, that he said, I am no longer under your orders. I belong to the Messiah. And he too was put in prison. Love overcomes all. The love of God. God says, love your enemies. You know, God says, love your enemies. Meaning, you don't just, if you just love your friends, what good is it? What are you doing? Even criminals, even, even in organized crime, they love their friends. What good is that? If you're just loving your friends, or you're loving those who are good, then what are you doing for this world? What are you, you're, if someone's good and you love them, what is the good that you're doing? The good you're doing is when you love those who are not lovable. That's when you're being a light to the world. See, God is not a realist, meaning he doesn't accept things as they are. Because he started, he said, well, but he created, he created everything out of nothing. There was nothing. He didn't accept that. He said, let there be. So those who are his children also can't be realists. They, they don't just accept things as they are and, and just call it as it is. They, they, they don't accept things as they are, but by faith, they call that which is not as if it was. Someone is unloving, you just you love them as if they were in the Lord. And, so, and, and people get, are transformed by that power. Love people as if they already loved you, because God loves you enough anyway. So, so just um, as if they did love you, as if because God does.